Hey there, and thank you for joining me on the Retro Game Couch. And in today's video, we're going to talk about my Commodore pet. This pet has been kind of not working right for about a year now. It started with the pet sometimes working and sometimes not working. And when it didn't work, tinkering around on the main board and pressing on some ICs would sometimes fix it up until the point where it didn't work at all. And that's the point where we are now. So in this video, we're gonna try and see if we can revive my pet. So, let's go. I don't have a lot of footage of the initial debugging as I didn't intend to do a video on this, but let me assure you I've spent countless hours trying to get it sorted. I've had many Facebook video calls with Dave from the Commodore 64 128 Facebook group. With his guidance, a multimeter and an oscilloscope, we probed around the mainboard of the pet looking for potential problems. So thank you Dave for your patience, time and knowledge. Evie from backbit.io sent over a chip tester pro with which I was able to test all the socketed ICs on the board for potential problems. The chip tester is a great tool for testing ICs. Just pop an IC in the socket, select the correct IC type from the menu and press the test button. With this tool I was able to determine that the 6502 CPU, the 6522 VIA and the 6520 PIA were all working fine. I didn't have to test any of the RAM or ROM chips as I was using a PET RAM ROM board that bypasses them. Evie, thank you for sending the chip tester over and everybody be sure to check it out on the official website, link in the description. Lastly a tool that was very important in pinpointing the problem was a PET video mixer which is a converter board that lets you hook up an external monitor to the 7 pin video connector of your Commodore PET. More on that later in the video. The route I eventually took was replacing the PET mainboard with the Mini PET mainboard by Tiny Mouth Software, which is a modern drop-in replacement for the PET mainboard, which uses modern alternatives for the CPU, the PIA and the VIA, but still retains compatibility with the original transformer, the original CRT keyboard and most of the external peripherals. You can order this fully assembled or the option I went with as a kit. I have to be completely honest here, as soon as I started soldering in the parts, I wish that I ordered the pre-assembled version. There are a lot, and I mean a lot, of pins to solder. You also have to consider polarity, sockets orientation and things like that. And while the manual is mostly sufficient, it's not the most detailed manual out there. Soldering all components and IC sockets to this board took me hours. It wasn't hard, it was just a lot. Finally, after a long afternoon of soldering, I was ready to power it on and it worked. However, choosing the kit over the pre-assembled version would come back to haunt me later. Here is the Minipad running on an external brick hooked up to an external LCD screen using the Minipad's built-in composite output. The original mainboard doesn't have this output and this is where the pet video mixer comes into play. So let's switch over to the pet video mixer by hooking that up to the 7 pin video connector of the pet mainboard. And as you can see, this works great too. This version of the pet video mixer was made by my friend Hayo based on the available schematics of the original video mixer project. The PCBs were generously sent to me for free by PCBWay, so thank you PCBWay for your donation to this project. However, I want to use the original 9-inch CRT, which means I have to use the original transformer, because that is what supplies the CRT with about 16 volts AC. So I hooked up the mini pad to the transformer and hooked up the CRT to the mini pad. And this straight up worked. So I left the test running and went to get a coffee and that's when the CRT crapped out. It started displaying horizontal lines and a green haze over the entire screen. You could barely make out the screen image. I ended up bringing the CRT to an electronics repair shop and their conclusion was that the CRT itself was broken beyond repair. And so the quest for a new CRT began. And those are very hard to find, but I was very lucky to find it locally. Big shout out to Marvin, a name who is very well known in the Dutch retro scene. Link to his webshop in the description below. 
because I had never worked on CRTs before, I asked for help on a Dutch website called tweakers.net. One of the people responding to the message was Frank, so I took my pet and the extra monitor over to him. He replaced all the capacitors on my controller board and disconnected my failing CRT. It was while disconnecting the old CRT that we found that one of the connections on the back of the CRT had broken off and was stuck in the plug that connects it to the board. So this is why my pet display wasn't working. We took the board from my original pet and took the connector and CRT from the other set and then connected that all together. And it worked like a charm. Thank you Frank for your expertise and hospitality. Oh, and before you ask, no, the board that came with the replacement CRT didn't work at all, even after replacing all capacitors. Next, I need to address the keyboard. It barely works. Some of the keys don't work at all, while others work about 50% of the time. Opening up the keyboard revealed that these rubber rings, which are probably for dampening the key presses, had all deteriorated. Pieces of it are everywhere, which can't be good for conductivity, so I removed all the remains of the old rubber rings. Next I applied a fresh coat of conductive paint to every plunger. The original conductive coating has mostly disappeared, which means keystrokes are not registered properly. After giving everything a good clean, I put it all back together and now all the keys work perfectly. The last thing I need to sort is storage. Oh, come on, for fuck's sake. I really don't want to use the old tape drive, so I bought a product called PET2SD, which is a modern storage solution for the PET. It eliminates the need for a tape or floppy drive, replacing it with an SD card. Remember when I told you that buying the kit over the pre-assembled version would come to haunt me later? Well, that later is now. I couldn't, for the love of me, get the SD to PET to work. It would seemingly load the program, but when I tried to run it or list it, it would just say ready and do nothing. And so I reached out to the future was 8-bit and they replied back with a very comprehensive email with things I could try. But the most important line was this. If that is not working, check all the connections around the 40 pin chips, the 7407s and the resistor arrays and check those are fitted the correct way around. I really didn't think too much of this, but I decided to check all the solder joints of the 40 pin IC sockets. And sure enough, if you look closely, you can see it. Look closer, a bit closer. Do you see it? I didn't solder this one pin, one tiny pin. I soldered it and sure enough, the SD2 pad started working. You can install the board in such a way that the edge connectors are lined up exactly with the ports on the back, like with the original main board. I chose to install the board completely internally. The PET is the most accessible computer I have, and for me, this just makes more sense. So here it is, a fully working PET. Let's play a game on it. So for now, thank you so much for watching. Please consider subscribing or becoming a patron that helps out the channel a lot. And I hope to see you next time on the Retro Game Couch.